there's a lot of information about how to build event source systems, what event systems are, that conflicts in the market today. And there's a lot of people who are confusing event-driven applications um, with event-sourced applications. So I just wanted to go over seven core principles that when you're building an event source system are going to help you succeed, right? A lot of these are taken from places where I've seen people trip up, event source systems haven't worked well, and the successes where I've seen good event source systems and how they work. Because when they're put together properly, they can be very powerful and very successful. So here they are. One, and this seems a little bit odd, but make sure what you're doing is actually event sourcing and not something that looks like event sourcing. Ensure global order. Invariants, only use the stream. This is very similar to microservices. As soon as your services need other stuff, you get trouble. Fine grain streams. Right? You don't want to replay the world every time. Optimist concurrency. That lets you be deterministic that the world hasn't changed underneath you while you're busy thinking about something. Right? No flags, no noble data in your events. We'll get into that a little bit deeper later. And commit as you go. So let's get into the details here making sure that you're actually event sourcing. So, my take on event sourcing is a rather literal version of it. Event sourcing says you derive the state in your application from a history of events, right? So if we look on the right here, we're showing two different types of discrete autonomy, right? effectively really have a fancy version of a Turing machine. If we see our event stream as a tape, where we write down the symbols, and then we read them back, make a decision to decide whether or not to write something out to the tape. The main difference is we're accepting input from the user, right? And we make a couple other constraints where we're saying we're doing append only, right? That's fundamentally what we're doing with event sourcing. There are a lot of people that talk about saving all of the commands in a series, saving all of the inputs, and that's their version of event sourcing. The problem you have with that is now without the state machine, right, and that state machine is different between version one of your project and version two. Every time you release the software, what's in that state machine changes. So if I need version one again to understand it, I either have to make that state machine understand every single possible variation from the beginning of time for all the commands, or it's going to give me a different result when I replay it. And the business hates that. If they were to report once, they get one number, they run it again, they get a slightly different number, they're going to lose their mind, right? If, so I want to make sure that that same machine produces the same expected result and allows me to change that result upon request. If the business decides that this series of events now means something different, if I'm event sourcing, I can do that. If I'm doing credit card monitoring and I change the window for late payments to say if I see one late payment in a month, you're fine to, I see one late payment in 15 days, that can change credit scores even though the facts remain unchanged. We want to be able to do that between version one and version two. The other thing I see people doing all the time is that private state on the right, they save that out. Again, I can't understand that state without an exact version of that machine. I can't take a new version and run it and get the new expected result. 
I also can't do time travel. I can't say, well, what if we had done a better job and then run against my historical data and find out if I'm right? If there's a new report that we need, I can't run that report on all of my historical data and get a new answer. Because normally if you have a new report and you're using a traditional database, the day you start it, you get one day of data. If you're using event sourcing and you come up with a new report, you can have historical data on that report back from the first time you started recording data. Right? So we want to make sure that the history of events, the history of your business changes, are what you're basing it on. And there was a really good question about DDD and events. Because we are doing something a little bit dangerous here. We're saying that we're going to write down an immutable event log of what happened. And as time changes with the business, what we recorded is all we have. Right? So Mark, um, 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 Eric Evans said one of the concepts he wished he'd gotten into the blue book was domain events. You know, business changes. That's the model we want to be thinking about as we record these events and updating our application history is domain events. And we want them to be as close to what happened as possible. Because using that domain language gives us the most stickiness to the way the business thinks about the problem, the way they're going to change their thinking about what they're going to do next. So if we have domain events in our event log, it's going to be the most robust for changes. It's going to be the easiest to write new reports, to create new features, because we're talking and thinking like the business. Right? All right. So just uh, on the right here, this is a state machine for accepting input and writing into the log. On the left here, we have a state machine, which is reading the log and creating all those projections that James just covered. So the view here could be SQL table, you know, a document and document database, a view in your system, a graph. It's whatever you need. So just two different types of state machines. Ensuring global order. So you'll see I've got the same slide all the way through. Because <laughs> this one slide can answer all these questions. So again, in a lot of systems, we don't have a guarantee as we're logging things to a stream or to different streams that the order will be the same between them, right? So if we look at something like you're writing into a data center here in Europe and you're writing into a data center in America, generally you'll get a local ordering, but there's no global ordering between them. Inside your application, you need to have a master global order, right? Between applications, you do not. But you need to understand what you're doing. If you can't have a global order, then these individual streams, you're eventually going to have reports and outputs in other parts of your system that are going to traverse the entire system. If I don't have a guaranteed ordering on replay, when I rerun that report, I won't get the same report. Right? And... There's a lot of times you think, well, how often or how important is it going to be for me to rerun the report? And the truth is you, you can basically accept you're going to have to rebuild downstream, aka derived state from your primary source. It's going to happen. There's three reasons it'll happen. It's going to happen because you have a fault in the system. You have a database, something's going to go offline, eventually you're going to have to rebuild it, right? The second one is the business is going to change their mind, right? You know, you go back to the example of credit reports. If the business changes their mind about what the facts mean, then you're going to have to restate the reports. Now, that could be because the business 
had a correction. They're like, oh yeah, no, I put that in wrong, we gotta change it. Or they could just say, our interpretation of this is now different. We know more now. And the third one is something no one likes to admit, defects. We're gonna have defects in these and we're gonna have to correct them. And when that occurs, we're gonna have to replay. Now, there are ways to optimize that by taking snapshots and understanding how far back you have to go, right? So the next one that I see people getting trouble, trouble with is invariant checks that must use the data in the stream. So what I mean here is in the state machine that's doing the writing, when I'm evaluating a command, which is a, a request to record something or change state in the system, right? we need to have certain rules the business wants us to keep. We want those rules to be evaluated based only by the events in the history for that system. So we want it to operate as a microservice. Because if we don't do that, and we have the state machine, for example, using some downstream state, you're gonna find all these long loopbacks and race conditions and unwinds and performance problems and bottlenecks, right? And while this is a sometimes a difficult constraint to deal with, it also answers one of the biggest questions I've always heard, how do I decide what's an aggregate? How do I decide what's a microservice, right? The answer is this microservice aggregate stream writer has to be autonomous. It needs to own all the data in the stream and it must be able to answer questions about it, right? And so you divide them up until you can do that. And that's how you know how big those aggregates, microservices, stream writers need to be. That's how you make them autonomous and you find out you break things out into finer levels. Does that make sense? All right. So this gets us to the next piece. When we're doing event sourcing, we don't want these state machines to have to run over days and days and days of data, right? We actually want what we need in the state machine to be fine-grained. And these fine-grained streams are logical subdivisions of the master log. So in the top log you see here, we have a master sequence number, and in each of these substreams, there's a local sequence number. So they're logical subdivisions of the master ordered stream. Right, because James was wrong about one thing, at least one thing. There's two, there's two queries that a stream database is very optimized for. One, time queries, time window queries, and second, getting a stream of events out, right? But we want to give it a nice targeted set of events for us to recover. This allows us to rehydrate these state machines very quickly if we need to. Right? We don't want to be going back over everything. So if you think about it, the event log at the top is your entire database. Don't think about one of these state machines running against, say, your account table. You want to think about the state machine running against one account ID. So you want to stream per instance for everything. Right? It owns just this instance. That's going to give you a fast recovery time. It's going to be easy to cache it live in memory. It's going to be easy to recover it, and you're going to be very performant. Right? And that's one of the things that's going to make the event sourcing work very well. Um, you can also, if you need to, because these are logical streams on the master log, you can also create other targeted virtual streams, especially for your read side here. You can create a stream by event type. 
You can carry that stream for the entire category. Suppose I want to listen, I want to have some remodel that's just churning on all of the account created, right? That's all it cares about. It doesn't care what kind of account it was. Any kind of account that was created, it wants to know about it. And, it, and the view here is perfectly valid for that not only to be a SQL server or a database, it can also be producing events. It can say, I'm going to watch these transactions, and when I see this pattern, I'm going to produce a new event, which is fraud alert, or a new event, which is cold customer status reached, right? So it can do cross-cutting concerns across all of the streams. And that's one of the reasons why it's actually reading off the master log or a targeted stream, right? This also gets into separating out your thoughts about the read side and the write side. They are completely decoupled in the system. And that offers a lot of opportunity. Optimistic concurrency. So you'll notice here that when we're writing to the stream, I'm not just depending to the end of the stream. I actually want to write position six. Right? Because most systems we're running, most microservices, I want microservices because they're small, they're easy. I want them to be highly available. I don't want to run just one. Most likely, if I have this account service out there, it's going to be able to hydrate any account instance, run an operation on it, and write it back into the database. Right? But what if I have a transaction on the same account in two different services? Right? I don't want the system to say, sure, we'll put them both in, no problem. Right? Think about if you had two transactions racing for your account, one of which is an ATM withdrawal for $1,000, and the other which is lock my account, because you just realized that your card was stolen. You want one of those to succeed. Ideally, we want the account lock to succeed first. But what we need in the system is deterministic ordering, right? We want to make sure that if I'm going to write to position six, that's because I have events one through five in my history. If there's an event six, I don't know what state things are in. So I want to throw an optimistic concurrency exception and not allow that write. And that same machine can then read event six and check it. But this allows the race conditions in a highly distributed system to be resolved at storage. What's written on disk wins. So if you turn the power off, you turn it back on, you've got a known state. And your SLA is, if it was written on disk, it's there. If it was not, then your transaction is not complete. And James's picture where we say we go through the store and then we report is about this principle. What got committed is what considered to be the record. Following that principle saves a whole lot of grief. No flags or nullable data in events. These are, this is one of the biggest warning signs I see for teams that have not fully understood the power of event sourcing, right? Because as soon as you have flags or nullable fields in your event, you don't really have an event. You actually have multiple events you folded into one, right? Who here has ever done uh, object hierarchy and table as a storage pattern, right? You take all these objects, any one of them will fit in this table because you're folding them all together. And so you have noble fields. Sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that, right? Because we've fully separated the two sides, we don't need to do that. We can actually do table per type. Why doesn't anyone ever do fourth normal form? Because it's a huge pain in a relational system 
to start doing all of his additional joints. Here, we don't have them. Here, we're subscribing to particular events and topics, and we can actually subscribe to the top level type for all of those events and get any one of them for somebody that needs it, or subscribe to just that targeted event for the things that need that. So now it's very easy to deal with type per table or fourth row form. And you also think about what it means if you're downstream. That means that every single downstream system in your application needs to understand how to unwind this event that's really four events, rather than just subscribing to what it cares about. So you're taking the logic of the writer and you're combining it with the logic in your readers, as opposed to making your type system clear, sane, and subscribable. Commit as you go. So, distributed transactions. One of the things that we've said is we're going to have microservices, things are going to be isolated, right? You only have your knowledge. That means that more and more, to get a business function done, you're going to need to com com commit across multiple microservices, right? And as we were just talking about, the more you lock, the more you do distributed actions, the more you're going to entangle yourself, slow yourself down, and then you're going to say, well, why don't I just put this in Mongo? Why don't I just, you know, why am I going through all this? There's a fancy name for this, which is a write-ahead log. But really what it means is that when I'm looking at a business process, that one service cannot commit directly, right? I need to interact between multiple services. I write down my intent. So if it's create user, my event is just going to be user created because I own the users and I'm fine. But if I'm like saying a trading system and I've got the, um, the block of orders and I want to make a placement, but I don't know if the broker is going to say yes or no to the placement. I don't create a placement here. I say placement requested because that's what happened. Then I process that placement request to the broker system and it attempts to finish the placement. That means the broker system will tell me whether or not that place occurs. That allows me to do my distributed transactions in a committed fashion. So if at any point you turn off the power, when I turn it back on, I can tell that I'm not in a valid state. All I need is a simple DR process to say, hey, do I have any requests that never finished? I can also have on that an SLA. If a placement has been requested, it should either have an indication of further processing or a rejection within this amount of time. So I can just have another read model watching that transaction process. It becomes a very simple pattern to have a watchdog just saying, well, anytime you see these two things out of bounds by SLA, raise an alert, tell someone, take an action. That way, I don't have to be watching. It's one of the ways I can watch all of my subsystems. It's also one of the ways you can mitigate things like um, eventual consistency. You just set an SLA and you report on things that expire. So, keeping to these seven principles as you build your systems will put you in very good stead for success with event sourcing. These are the key things I see time and time again. They either help you or in some cases force you to make the right decisions and face the right problems up front. Make sure you're actually event sourcing. It's not change data capture. It's not taking snapshots. It's not recording commands. Ensure global order, because otherwise you're going to get to a report 
or you're going to get into a replay and life is going to suck. Invariants are in the stream. Use the commit as you go pattern to bridge those individual streams. Use fine grained streams because you need that speed and isolation. It also, by the way, fine grained streams and keeping your invariant checks local make your unit tests simple, easy, fast, deterministic. They reduce your cognitive load in understanding the system tremendously. And you can start to get provably correct. Optimistic concurrency. Just turn it on, make it work. It allows you to distribute, to run at scale, and still be safe. Flags are noble data are a sign that you haven't actually modeled the business intent of the change. Right? You're going back into a developer mindset. The other thing about commit as you go that I like to talk about is when people think about sagas or distributed transactions, they're actually, in my mind, more of a developer IT invention. Because what are we saying? We're actually saying if all of these things don't occur, we're going to unwind all of them as if none of them occurred. Right? Whereas in actual business terms, in most cases, something has occurred, but it didn't finish correctly. And having a conversation with the business about what happens when that doesn't finish is extremely profitable, both for you and for them. One of the best examples that I got from Craig years ago was delivering snowplows. If you, you're in Montreal, you manufacture snowplows, because Canada uses a lot of them, but you sell them into the US. You have an order, you process the order, you start delivery, your snowplow is in New York, across the border, a thousand miles away, and the city that bought it cancels the order. Something went wrong with the purchasing process. Are we, un are we gonna unwind that? Are we gonna suddenly say, nope, the truck never left the yard. That order was canceled, truck's in the yard, we don't have anybody stuck in New York, right? So that's a grand scale, but that's the concept of committing as you go, right? The truck did leave, the driver is in New York, raise it up to a user, ask him what to do. I'll bet you that salesman will sit down and he'll find a different city that wants a snowball like that or close enough for a discount. And he'll get that sold. But that's not something the software can do. So our job is just to record what decisions were made and help the business do their job. All right. So that's all I've got. I try to be a lot faster than James. I hope I succeeded. Balance things out here a little bit. And I do have time for questions. typically find as the biggest barriers to entry for guys, uh, for dev teams looking to use event sourcing? The biggest barrier to entry is that mind shift to a series of business events is what you've got to be thinking about and using those state machines and getting away from the <clears throat> magic of the relational database. So the relational database is awesome in its ability to like pause time change everything, and then start time up again. And getting away from that to having this, this really like third, fourth normal form concept of what change, what do we need to keep track of? Because one of the sidelines there is in the state machine, that private state should be sparse. It's only the things you need to check a new command. If that data isn't used, it should be passed through. It comes from the command. It goes on the event, it goes in the stream, and then the read model deals with it, right? That, that separation in working through a couple examples, folding that pattern, and once you make that mind shift, I actually, one of the standard saws is only event source things you need to because of the barriers. Once you and your team understand it, that's the barrier. Then event source everything. 
Right. It's just, just one more thing before I pass this on. It's just in, in terms of infrastructure. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, you mentioned a lot of things. You know, I'm just thinking in terms of transactional guarantees around uh, the different, uh, you know, things getting pushed onto queues and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Just in terms of that, uh, what are the barriers there? I mean, typically that's quite a so fair amount of infrastructure. I would required. either, I would use, the first thing I would say is use a database. All right. Either use something that runs on SQL, Oracle, or Event Store. Don't use a log. Don't use a bus. Because that's where you're going to get the optimistic concurrency. If you go with something like Event Store, which is a dedicated stream database, you'll get your fine grained streams. But you need those semantic capabilities. And then once you're past your core database, then use whatever you want. And then understand also the difference between your application and the rest of your system. Because there you get into the thing between your private schema, like in a database. Would you ever let another app read your private schema? So don't let any of your private events out. Use a reader to create a public set of events for external consumption. And those are what go on Kinesis or Kafka or the Azure Service Bus. Does that help? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, second answer to that as well. Um, actually, not to that one, sorry, to the first one about barriers to entry. Actually, the, the biggest barriers to entry that I've down for the teams is there are two things. The first is um, the first is that there's a lot of documentation about this kind of thing, but most of it is wrong and leads you down that path. And that's something that um, needs to be fixed. And actually, uh, we're starting to try to fix that from from a vestor's perspective. It causes us a lot of problems because we have customers doing things which are. Uh, you know, which lead to infrastructure problems on the road, and so we're actively trying to fix that now. But that's going to take a while because there's, there's so much bad information. Yeah. And it comes from sources which are otherwise credible, and they are describing patterns which are valid patterns, they're just not event sourcing. Right. Uh, yeah, event driven architectures are fine, but they're event driven, not event sourced. Yeah. Command sourcing is very useful for disconnected apps, yeah. it's not event sourcing. There's a bunch of stuff that's, yeah. like, that's disconnected, but is, is still um, related. The second thing is uh, actually a, a connection to, or a an attachment to object-oriented programming without understanding what object-oriented programming is. So actually, here's a question for the room. Um, what are the two key principles? There are two key principles of object-oriented programming. What are they? Yes, they are. They are. Yeah. So the, the two that everybody says normally are um, inheritance and polymorphism. Um, and polymorphism is trivial to get rid of because, as a foundational principle of object oriented programming, because it's clearly not. Um, is C an object oriented language? No. Uh, what is standard in? And the answer is well, depends what you connect, right? It might be a file, it might be a TTY, it might be a printer, it might be a modem. That sounds pretty damn polymorphic to me because I can just write to this thing and yeah, sure. Um, so if C can do it, it's probably not a foundation for the principle of object oriented programming. Um, and the other one is uh, encapsulation. Sorry, as well as people have to come up with. Uh, encapsulation is another one, but like, okay, how do I encapsulate in C? Well, I just don't put whatever I don't want other people to see in my header file. And if we ignore buffer overruns for a minute, which is hard to do, but we ignore it for a second, that sounds like it can be encapsulated pretty well in C, which again means that it can't be a foundation principle of object oriented programs, but things do it just as well. Um, like the, the principle of object oriented programming is, is exactly that it's that you want, um, <coughs> you want private states to. <laughs> You want to set, you want to present a boundary to the world, into which you can send messages, and out of which come messages for other things. And if you look at something like Erlang, that's much, much closer to object-oriented programming as it was defined by Alan Kay, and which is a useful definition, than something like C with classes, which most of the object-oriented programming languages in use today actually are. Um, the other, like, so Alan Kay posted on Hacker News recently. There was good, like, clearly some, like, 19 year old JavaScript programmer, nothing against those, but um, who was posting about like 
why this guy's answer on the internet was wrong about what object-oriented programming was, and the guy's response was, I am Alan Kay. <laughs> well, okay, shut down that argument. Um, so, Alan Kay defines small talk in the late, uh, late 70s. Zero to part, so yeah, late 70s, early 80s, I guess. And the, the, so, in, does anybody have programmed Objective-C? So Objective-C, like you'd use for iOS, or you would have used for iOS a few years ago, is the closest relative to small talk is still really in use. Um, and in small talk, you didn't call methods on objects. You sent messages to objects, and the method call was laid out. And so according to Alan Kay, the definition of object-oriented programming is late binding everything and sending messages. And that's a, that's a definition I'm willing to take on the basis that he's the one that invented it. Um, and if you think of business objects in that form as things that receive messages, do some work, and then produce some more messages, um, in a late bound fashion, then um, you this useful definition. But if you think of it as classes, where um, you know, classes that represent a particular row in a database, then it's not a particular <coughs> for trying to model actual real world properties. So those are the two barriers for entry. Actually, people get trained for years and years and years. Like all the way through university now, computer science graduates get trained that object oriented programming is classes with inheritance. Um, Parametric Cars and tanks and dogs and cats and yeah. fruits and bananas. Everyone trained for it. <coughs> Bring it on. Cat inherits dog in the book. That's very reasonable. And the other thing about the messages is a log is equivalent to a queue where you wrote everything down in order. So a message queue and an event log is just semantically a log of events, or a queue of events, same thing. But it's persisted, so it's repeatable and durable. You had another question? Yeah, actually I got two questions. Uh, maybe one is related to the other one. Um, I'm trying to uh, wrap my head around uh, versioning and data structures yep. over time. Sure. Uh, how, do, how does one manage V1, V2, V3? V1, V2, okay. Uh, so, of, so the first thing you're going to do, so that's actually answered in a number of different places. So one, by ensuring we're not coupling commands or private state to our persistence, we're going to allow our decisions, our state machines, to version on the same events, right? So the exact same business events are, um, can be running different machines, if you will. So different services or different versions of the same service. Are the, that, sorry, are the, are the machines then also persistent? No. No, those are code. So they're brought up, they're code, they're run, they produce a state that you don't know what it, you know, that's private to it, they produce another event that's written down publicly in their stream, and they go away. So and that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid things that need that particular set of code to be understood. So the next thing we do is we want these events to be business events, because business events are not going to change as fast as other things. And then we can also project them into new views, right, as the business request changes. However, we're then going to find those events are going to change. So we've protected ourselves two ways, but they are going to change. They are going to need to be versioned. So the first thing we do is we use a weak schema. <coughs> we don't want to serialize the events as binary serialization. We want to use something like JSON. Right? Because if you go back to like a relational table, if I add a new column and I give it a default, I can keep on extending that table. And other things that are reading it that are older don't break. So with a weak schema, we can do that. I can add a new field that's new, right? And not break old things. I can stop using an existing field, right? So that's the, the second basic way to do it. Um, is that weak schema. And if you can't make a change with that weak schema, you probably have a new event. So then you actually can go back and reiterate. Your break glass approach to versioning is you actually just take a stream, create a transformer for your update, and you write out a new stream. 
Right, that's like, oh, like this is all wrong, yeah. So you get a new cue mm -hmm. and you write it out. Okay. The other thing that helps out with that is plan your data um, retention strategies. So you should do this with all of your databases, mm -hmm. right, anything. But here, if I actually plan to rule the books and do a cutover on a business schedule like the end of the year, I can take those old events, put them in an archive system. Right? And then I can have an archive viewer on that if they need it, but it's not part of my live system. Mm. It's easier to maintain. I can save money on storage. I'm going to have different SLAs and probably even different use cases. And that means I only have to survive. I have two or three versions of the events in that. I don't have this long tail of 10 years of changes that everything's got to understand. There are more advanced approaches using checkpoints, and as of, you know, well, but you don't get into that. Read Greg's book, it's all in pub, versioning event source systems. Versioning event source systems is basically the answer to all of those questions. It has yeah. you know, 50 different strategies for dealing with these things. It's complicated. Yeah, the, the, patterns, I, the <laughs> patterns I talk about are the first <laughs> ones in the book. Um, and another question is about, uh, you know, in Europe there's something called GDPR. Yes. <laughs> um, because we're storing the whole history, how do we so manage we got, it? So we have two options generally on that. The first is key shredding, which is you take the data you want to be able to get rid of and you encrypt it. Yeah. And then when they say, I want to be forgotten, you destroy the key. So all the data is there, it's now just random bytes. It's, it's one still way, there, but it's not value. Not accessible. Mm. Your company can no longer gain access to it. Some people have problems with that. One of the ways to deal with that is you separate that data out. So you have your core customer identifier, and then the private data or the identity data is stored separately. So you can keep your record of, I had this customer. These things happened. When they want to be forgotten, I don't know who that was. Right, you just keep the, the key. Like, yeah. The yeah. key so in the, the, in the uh, just name. It's, in, it's actually a patents of enterprise application architecture. Mm -hmm. yep. So instead of storing the data that you might need to delete, you store a key for it, and then you, you have some ability to look up that data by the key. Yep. And you accept that if the key, if the user withdraws consent, then you have to go delete that data. Right. Uh, my personal preference is the key shredding one because uh, it's just meter. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's actually not been tested in court. So yeah. Right. So and the last. You can get and the last thing to remember is not all personal data is subject to deletion. If you're keeping a record of someone like a stockbroker who's making trades, you're keeping that data not because they consent, but because of regulation. Yeah. Yeah. So regulation not all of the user stuff. data yeah. is subject to that. Thank you. Um, I guess it's a question around the approach to solving the problem around event sourcing. There's a few different uh, tools out there, uh, especially on the JVM, I think they've got Lagom and, and the mm -hmm. Axon framework, but they approach it from a different angle. They almost persist as agnostic, whereas Event Store starts with, with the database. So Event Store is a database, yeah. it's a framework for building an application. Yeah, right. yeah. So, 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 so. It has, um, the interface of Event Store is put this event on the screen if the version number hasn't changed since you last used it. Um, and then we can try writing and read these events and subscribe to these right. events. There is some more to it than that, but that's the first part. It doesn't say, it doesn't have any opinion about what, how you build your application, what right. technology, what, whether you use a functional style, whether you use an object oriented style, whether you. Uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, yeah. Are you even really, whether you do it in bed sourcing, actually. They have yeah. no opinions on that. Um, if you start from a framework approach, you will get framework problems. So mm -hmm. it will work until it doesn't, and then you are. You really want a library. Some of you, you're so, pulling in tools you need, not using the framework to do what you want to do. And Event Store will run on Linux just fine, gives you an endpoint, there's a Java client, right? And you know, pull, you want something that lets you pull what you need out and not starting with a framework. Because mm -hmm. with a framework, a lot of these decisions on how to do things are made for you. And very honestly, how I would set up event sourcing for a line of business application and how I would set up event sourcing for a high performance application in like medical imaging or trading, very different. 
entirely different frameworks, approaches, setups, because they don't work for each other. Mm -hmm. One of them, I want something that's simple, so to use the latest tools, my developer is going to be able to, to deal with the other one. It's like, no, I want to control every thread. I want to do this, I want to do that. And frameworks make all these choices. They don't just make one, they have to make them all. It's actually just another, this is the extension of that, which is like, event sourcing at its core is really simple, right? It's a left fold of some data. Like, you want a framework for that? Probably not. Right. Like, your language probably has a not fold function in right. it that was written since 2001. So, actually, you just don't need it. Right. Like, fundamentally, introducing a that framework is always more complicated than not introducing a framework for almost every. Uh, by that, I mean like a .NET framework, like a, like a runtime. But I mean, like adopting, adopting Spring is always more complicated than not adopting Spring. And that's an example that both .NET and Java users can agree on. So, um, Java became a numbers of DSL for converting XML into backtraces because of Spring. And, um, but so, fundamentally, uh, it's a really simple problem. And it's, it's a fold. And it's writing to a database. And it's somehow exposing that to a user using a place. Probably an HTTP API in 2007. What year again? 2019. Um, fundamentally, you don't, need, you don't need anything to do that for you. Now, where it is useful is where you can have a bunch of the work done for you. And for that, there are a bunch of choices. There's some great libraries that I see I didn't pause on. That way, you're on the net platform. Uh, dot .NET. Oh, dot .NET? Okay. In that case, there are like five or six oh, yeah. high quality libraries rather than frameworks that you can choose from to right. do the heavy lifting for you without making important decisions for you. One of my favorites is called Aggregate Source. Yep. Uh, it's a guy called Ian Freeman in uh, Belgium. Uh, he did a lot of work on that. He contributed to it for a while back. There's, uh, there's probably 10 others as well, right. all of which make slightly different decisions and you, you interact with them in a slightly different way and you can evaluate them. But right. the important thing is to make sure you're in control of the entry point of the application, of the entry point per request, and the threading model of the application. So there's a bunch of them that use things like actor models, and you probably don't want those because you have no control over where anything happens. And right. no ability to make trade-offs to scale what you want. So I wrote a framework that I use in my workshops to teach event sourcing in about a weekend. Right, so it's not a lot of code. I've also, I'm uh, one of the original members of a framework, uh, Reactor Domain, but that's very targeted for high performance and it makes a bunch of decisions about SATA. But I don't know what would be appropriate for what you're doing. If you want yeah. something more object oriented, uh, aggregate source is gonna be way better. So. Yeah, I was just asking about the approach. It's completely different to a framework. Framework might be too prescriptive, as you said, right. in certain circumstances. I've, I've worked in three different event sourcing systems and written it three different times. Yeah. Right, because so, right. it's, it's, it's not that hard. Yeah. You, you make like 10 or 15 decisions and you're done. Yeah. Actually, I have a post on my blog. And it turns out it's basically the last post on my blog because although I say I have a blog, I actually post on it last night in 2014. Um, it doesn't go. Which is not the most expressive language in the world, and it's seriously it's like 50 lines of code. Mm -hmm. so, not that much. Question, all right? Curious, um, working with large data sources. Yep. Do you have any tips on archiving the data or uh, optimizing for uh, re um, fast reading? So, um, cache, cache, cache. So, one of the things that we get about from an immutable log is we solve one of the hard problems in computer science, cache invalidation, right? The state at position nine is never going to change. We might be stale, but we're never going to be wrong, right? And if I have, you know, a billion events, you know, when you have customers that have data sets this size, I'm not going to be using the tail of that very often. So what I want to do is I want to use independently running collectors that are running all the time, producing targeted, consumable views of the data, and then <coughs> storing those either in a memory cache or in document, graph, or relational database for queries. One of the keys about those is always include in your state the position, your checkpoint, 
That way you know where it's at, right? And you know whether the design's valid or whether that's something to do. So whenever you write out your table, write the checkpoint of when that table update is equivalent to in your primary source. The other thing that's really good about that, once you start caching and distributing, the fact that we've got a simple incrementing number on our position is wonderful for message out of order detection, right? If, I, if I'm on five and I hit seven, I know I missed six. So right? it's predictable, the ID. Right. And so and as you build up captures and you have these systems out there, you want to know where you're at, you know you can uh, ignore something with a lower sequence number. Right? And if you do need to bring together separate streams where you don't have the global ordering, then use uh, vector clocks. And that's just taking the position in each one of the streams and creating them as a tuple, right? You know, two or three part for each one. And then that gives you position in the cache. Vector blocking. Okay. Right. Thank you. Does the, does the event store support asset transactions? Um, yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry, I saw that one. Yeah. Yes, it does. Awesome. Actually, so let me, let me explain that. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, it does. Um, in, so, you can atomically, consistently in an isolated and fashion, um, append one or more events to a given stream. Right. You cannot do it across more than one stream. So, you can't write to order A and order B in a transaction consistent manner. Mm -hmm. But you also probably don't want to do that because right. the point of a stream is it's the consistency manner is it's also a nice transaction. Um, there are, so technically, we could allow you to do that, but from an API perspective, we don't want to because it prevents you from being able to horizontally scale in the future. Uh, so it's, a, it's an artificial limitation that we put in there to prevent you doing bad things. Uh, but yes, you can with the stream. Yeah, right. I, think, I, think, I think it's important, at least on a stream level. Oh, on a stream level? It's oh, yeah. Critical. Uh, right, no, it's, I, just, I just thought, you know, if, if, if you use right. Mongo, you'd be stuffed. You'd have to go write it all yourself. Right, right, exactly. And, and, that's, that's, and that's why... Tools to write it yourself. Right? Uh, so there's one... Um, there's an aspect of it which is... Um, especially... long-running transactions. So, there's no reason in principle with, uh, because of the data model of event store, you can, in principle, there's no reason you should do this, but you can, in principle, open a transaction today, write an event to it. Write another event in five years' time and commit the transaction. If the state of the stream is still correct in five years' time, such that it should succeed, it will succeed because of the data. Mm. Um, you should not do that because that's yeah, no. stupid. Yeah. Actually, we probably shouldn't allow you to do it. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's also no compelling reason to stop people doing all bad things. Just bad right. things. And, and that's one of the reasons why I said pick a database because you need that asset commit. Yeah. You know, and then the stream boundaries are just good for your application and good for performance. And if you can commit more than one event together on a stream, do that because the performance is just better. Do you have any practical advice, especially for larger teams working on event source systems, how to ensure that events, say, develop time, do not get tampered with over time, that somebody accidentally removes a property before? How what gets... How once... Uh, what's that? So I think the no, I just didn't hear it. So, so I think the no. question is, how do you ensure in a large team that people don't... Uh, modify the definitions of events exactly. when they shouldn't. Open. All right. So there's a a new formalization of an old technique called event modeling that I've been using. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I got taught by Greg Weiler to do it, and it's just it's like event storming, but you create a durable model with all the data in it as a team living document to document the commands, events, and views of your system. And that becomes a template for what you're building in the system. Mm -hmm. So you make sure that document is isomorphic. Mm -hmm. And so changes happen in the document first, 
with version control and conversations. So before, it's before it goes into the code. Co so yeah, you start off with your event storming, you do a formal blueprint of your system, get all of your, because effectively your events and your commands and your views become the public or the internal API or schema of your system. It's your ER diagram. There's actually another side, which is actually a private schema can you can change yeah. the definition of what events is, provided nobody else can. If it's within your boundary, then right. it's expected, actually, that as the system ages, you will change the definition. Right. And there are some strategies you have to deal with around versioning, and the versioning group that they're kind of hard to get to without some diagrams. Like yeah. Um, <laughs> download the, that look at the book and see how there's some other techniques for this. The most important thing is that you don't break public guarantees. Um, which is mostly around putting a version number on everything. So never say, like, here is X, it's here is version one of X, and then make consumers negotiate the version they understand or something. Uh, a bit like HTTP works with content negotiation, or a bit like a lot of protocols have like, this, this graceful downgrade system. Uh, and we actually had a model in event store that worked really well for this. So it was designed for distribution systems. So one of the interfaces to event store is an atom feed. You can uh, read an atom feed and you get a stream as an atom feed. But the atom feed contains links to the individual events, and you can content negotiate on the individual types of events. So if you're going to build, say, uh, uh, this is actually implemented so that it could build something like a distribution master system for securities for a bank or something like that. Every system in the bank needs to know something about it, but then it will be able to upgrade at the same time to know about the latest version. So you should be able to negotiate with something to say, I want to know about this, but I only understand version four of what it means to be a security. But this other thing over here can know about version five of what it means to be a security. So you can negotiate everything internally, um, materialize it in real time, rather than having to be stuck with it. There's a whole bunch of patterns around this that are kind of hard to get into. But there's, um, there's, some, there's some decent prior art here around protocol design, rather than sure. strictly messy. And just treat anything you're going to publish publicly outside of your private schema as something you have to live with for a long time. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Infinitely cashable means. Yeah. Right. Questions? Cool. Thank you all very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs> to you.